Okay, all. Thank you so much for joining us uh, this evening or this afternoon. And Scott told you what our topic is today, comparing shared death experiences to near death experiences, a revealing picture. I want to begin by sharing with you our mission of the Shared Crossing Project, and it is to positively transform relationships to death and dying through education and raising awareness about shared crossings and their healing benefits. We also have a research arm and we call it the Shared Crossing Research Initiative. And we do four things. The first of those is to study end of life phenomena, which we call shared crossings. We collect and analyze shared crossing accounts from around the globe. We focus on their therapeutic benefits. And we are advocates for education about shared crossings at, at the healthcare level, particularly in end of life, but also we offer education programs for the general public. The key points of today's lecture are, we're gonna highlight the, rel the relevance of SDEs and NDEs in today's uh, climate or what we're going through as a culture and around the world. We're gonna define SDEs. We're gonna compare the features, some of the primary features between SDEs and NDEs. We're gonna identify common after effects and we're gonna summarize the key themes related to SDEs and NDEs. So the relevance of SDEs and NDEs could not be more poignant in today's environment with the COVID pandemic roaring across the world. And this is because as all of us know, during this pandemic and particularly in the beginning, many people and a lot of our loved ones were in hospitals and they were essentially dying alone for precautions that were necessary, family members, loved ones were not able to be at the side of their dying loved ones. And so the question surfaced and surfaced profoundly in our culture. Do we really die alone? Do we really die alone? What we'll see today is that SDEs and NDEs provide perhaps the most sage insights into what happens in this journey from this life to what lies beyond. The shared death experience, so many of you are familiar with the NDE, so we're not going to go into that in detail, but we will give you a working definition for the SDE. It's an experience where a loved one, caregiver, or bystander expresses that they have shared in this transition with their departing loved one into a benevolent afterlife. Where and when do SDEs occur? Well, they can happen at bedside and they can happen remotely. That means you don't need to be at the bedside to have an SDE. They happen in and around the time of death. Most of them happen right at the time of death, but our research suggests they happen hours and sometimes days, either before or after. And you, there can be more than one person having an, an SDE, sharing in the SDE, so you can have somebody at bedside and you can have someone across the country both having an SDE, and they can even happen at different times. So NDEs and SDEs. So many of you know the history of NDEs, but we'll go over it. Raymond Moody's book, Life After Life in 1975, brought into our culture the knowledge of the, S of the NDE. From that point forward, NDEs grew in popularity and understanding. Today, NDEs are a part of our shared cultural understanding, if you will, of these experiences. Moody wrote in 2010 a book entitled Glimpses of Eternity, and this focused on SDEs. But these, this book was not as well received as Life After Life, and there are some profound reasons for that, namely because it is thought that SDEs impact everybody. We know everybody's going to die. And so there was some sense by Raymond and others in the field that maybe our culture wasn't ready for SDEs at that time. But we're hoping that now they are. We know that this is coming and NDEs and SDEs are so similar. And that's what we're going to focus on today. Here are the features, the primary features that both SDEs and NDEs share. And in today's uh, presentation, we're gonna focus on the top three there in the upper left-hand corner. Encounters with spirit got beings, the transcendent light, and life reviews. So it is important to note that the primary difference between SDEs and NDEs are this. 
And NDE occurs in people who are actually experiencing a brush with death. SDEs occur with caregivers and loved ones and sometimes bystanders who are not actually dying at all. They are healthy in mind and body. So the first feature we're going to focus on today is encountering beings. Um, so the appearance of mystical beings or previously deceased loved ones, that's a common appearance in, in a number of NDE reports. Uh, we notice that this appears in shared death experiences as well, although it only appears in about 15% of the narratives we've gathered, and we've gathered just under 200 of these accounts. Uh, we do note, though, that almost half of all of the SDE reports we've gathered actually include encounters with the person who is dying. So we'd like to start off, uh, we're going to be showing a, a several videos throughout our presentation. We'd like to start off by sharing a video that we gathered with Mark. Mark had an SDE with his father. It's a remote case. Um, I should highlight that uh, Mark eventually received confirmation that his father had died the very next morning after what transpired that we're going to share with you. But I want to highlight here that Mark's an adept. He's um, He's quite familiar with the, the terrain of consciousness. He's an avid meditator and he's quite experienced and uh, you'll get a sense for that. And I also wanna highlight that here, he encounters not only the dying, his father, uh, but previously deceased loved ones as well. We knew he had pancreatic cancer, and, but at this point my dad's in the hospital. And, uh, um, and so I, we're, we're, you know, I've been out in the woods for, for two weeks, you know, and uh, I was driving back up to the farm that, that we, that, that I lived at with my friend Brian and Biddy. And um, I was super tired, you know, I hadn't slept much in two weeks. And so I just put the seat back in the chair, you know, and, and um, um, as soon as I did that, like, you know, I just, I could feel my father. I was like, I need to check in on, you know, and, um, so I sent myself, I sent my spirit to, to the hospital where I knew he was. And I get there and he was just a wraith, you know, of a man. And I, I remember going to him at his bedside and speaking to him and saying, you know, dad, it's like, why don't you just let go? You know, mom's going to be all right. You know, all his kids are going to be all right. You know, you can go. Like, there's nothing holding you there. And he looks at me, and you know, there's no surprise in his face that I was actually there talking to him. But the, the, the puzzlement was in his face as he said, I don't know how. He said, I don't know how. I started, I started that meditation, you know, walking down this particular trail. And at a certain point, turning and step up these stairs and, and walking towards the light. And as after I climbed these stairs, um, his ethereal body has, was becoming stronger and stronger to the point where like I, I was able to set him down and he walked with me. And um, so we're walking side by side and I took him to the light. And as we got close, my father and my grandmother had a really, really close and beautiful and amazing magical relationship. And she passed away in 1978. As we got close to the to the light, you know, there's like a door with where the the the, the, numin the numinosity of the light coming out of there was just um, was unbelievable. And my grandmother steps out of that light, and she's standing there. The look of joy on his face when when he saw my grandmother was just like the look I had seen in his face in, in years and years and years. Um, and he just. And they, he just went and hugged her and hugged her. And my uncle came out of the light at that point. I had one uncle that had passed at that point. And he, and he joined the fray and the three of them were just, just you know, just, again, the, the, the joy was just unbelievable. And, you know, none of them touched me. You know, they, they were very, 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 very clearly that I wasn't part of that group. But, you know, that my job was done. Like, I brought my dad there. And now, like, they had it. It was really how it felt. And they didn't speak to me either. And um, and then my dad, he just turns and looks at me. It's just this huge smile on his face. And he just said, 
died. I just, I didn't know that it was this easy. And then the three of them turned and, and walked in for the night. And, um, and the next thing I came, I come to and I'm in the seat of my friend Brian's truck and we're just pulling into the farmyard. And again, just to, to reiterate, uh, the next morning he receives a call from his brother saying that his father had died and he announces that he knows that. Um, but what we wanted to focus on here is this is a lovely example of an individual uh, having an encounter with the dying in a remote instance. But not only does he see the dying, he also sees previously deceased loved ones. And some of you might have also noted not, not only does he see this brilliant light, but he comes across a border that he really can't go beyond. Uh, so we've shown you an example of someone um, having an encounter with the dying as well as previously deceased loved ones. Here we're going to show you the case of Angela. So Angela had an SDE with her mother-in-law. It's a bedside case and it was in a home surrounded by family and friends. Here she uh, witnesses not only the spirit of the dying but two angels as well. I didn't particularly have a close relationship with her, unfortunately. Um, I wish it had been, it was close at the end. Jean, my mother-in-law, um, she wasn't with it. She was, she was completely unconscious um, and she, was, she wasn't even being fed. Um, she was um, on the heavy medication now. As I went into the kitchen and I just glanced over, I noticed that the room was a welcoming gold colour and it looked as though you wanted to be in there. As I got to the room, it felt like the whole room was in some kind of a bubble and not to enter it. I felt as though I shouldn't go into that room. So, uh, but as I noticed, Jean had something, not out of her head, but in like the centre of her body here, was about a foot away from her body. It was translucent and it was moving out of her body but you could see through it i couldn't believe it and in the corner of the room the very corner to the left um in the right in the corner there was a massive angel with huge wings it's like a bird white wings i say it's an angel i don't know it didn't even have a head to be honest with you but it was a white being it was white it wasn't translucent and its wings were moving with the tips of them moving inwards like that. Beckoning motion, a strong beckoning. I thought I couldn't believe it. And she was like moving, she wasn't shaped, she was just translucent, irregular ball, not even a ball, it was an irregular shape. It wasn't a shape of a person or anything. And she and it was moving up to this this white beam that was doing this movement, but there was another smaller one, the other side, doing the same movement. Exactly, it's a, and there was a very, very, very high-pitched tone, and it felt as though this was all included with the bubble that was in this whole room. This um, white beam seemed to turn to me in quite a, I don't know how to put this, in quite a, it was telepathic to me, but it turned to me, it didn't even have a head, but it turned to me and it said to me, wait, wait. And this other little one on the other side seemed to turn to it in a panicking kind of way, as if to say, what are we going to do now? And was doing it as well. They were going a bit faster in a bit of an urgency going on. So I said to Dorothy, she definitely died. And with that, Dorothy come barging past me into the room and as she kept got into the room and she disappeared into the corner so angela is sharing an account where she sees what she believes to be the spirit of her mother-in-law leaving the body at the same time she sees two beings she identifies as angels at seemingly um performing certain operations to enable this. She even comments uh, in a manner that, that seems to evoke this idea that maybe one angel is learning from the other. Uh, but there are a number of features there. Those are, however, the ones we would like to focus on um, at the moment because this leads into a, a unique aspect. So uh, this feature where somebody, there's a force that seems to be guiding this transition 
we refer to this force as the conductor. And uh, it was it was seen very well in Angela's case, if you see the language she used, there is this angel beckoning, calling forth the, the spirit of Angela's mother-in-law and even giving kind of commands and directions, wait, wait. This is what we see in the conductor, this force that appears in different forms. Sometimes it appears as an angel, as we saw with Angela. Sometimes it's so, a known being that's previously deceased, like a, a revered or respected relative. And sometimes it's an unknown figure. One person referred to this being that was present at times, silhouetted, not clear, but as referred to as the mysterious man. And so sometimes, most of the time it's seen, but a lot of times it's unseen, but sensed. There's a sense that there is some force, benevolent, guiding this whole transition. And as you saw with Angela, there was a, a purposefulness. It was focused. It had a task to do. And so in our next uh, case here, this is Angela B. She's going to be sharing uh, her experience bedside <laughs> with her son, Tom. Tom is 13 years old at the time, and sadly dying of cancer. And so you'll, uh, what I want you to take a look at or focus on is this beautiful young lady that Amelia refers to. This is the conductor. And notice the continence and character of this conductor, the way she engages this whole transition. And I just think he used to keep us grounded and kept us together. He had sort of blonde hair and blue eyes and just was there and was a very kind of solid place of reason, really. He just, he just built up very kind of strong relationships with everybody he came into contact with, really. He, I just always felt there was something just very special about Tom. Well, people were sleeping all over the place on sofas and everywhere. Um, it was a, all the lights were on. It just felt a very fuzzy house, really. And Tom was sleeping. He, um, he was just breathing very, very gently, just a very gentle breath. I was just on my head right next to him, so feel his breath. And I closed my eyes. And so I just closed my eyes and there, instantaneously, immediately, was this video, like a scene, so clearly that I can remember it so clearly now. And it was a woman walking towards what I thought was me. And I didn't think of Tom. So I wasn't really thinking of Tom. When I was watching her, I completely wasn't thinking about Tom, which is why when I came out of it, I thought, what, Tom, what was I doing? You know, because I just saw her and I just remember watching her like I watched a film and I thought, she's a beautiful young woman. She's so beautiful. And I remember, and I remember thinking, actually, I must remember this. I must remember this. I must remember that she's beautiful. And she had a pale face and a sort of slightly pointy chin. So her face was like a heart, a very pronounced cheekbone. She wasn't anybody I recognised. Well, I wish, I wish I could say, I think it was, I can't. She had dark hair that was sort of like women wore in the 70s. She was wearing a gown. And it was one that kind of crossed over and it had like a tie, you know, a proper gown that was like in white. The main thing I remember thinking about her was, gosh, she needs to get somewhere. She's urgent, she's purposeful. And I remember thinking, but she's not running, she's not late. She, it's not like she's, like I'm someone's late for a meeting, like out of breath, or it was just that she had a look in her eyes like, I must be, I must be there at this time. It, so clearly I remember thinking, She's got to be at this assignation at this time. And so she was walking quickly with purpose and with intent. But it was sort of somehow really important to me that I knew that she had to be at a certain place at a certain time, um, that she was going to make sure that she got there. And then I looked what she was walking through, and it was a tunnel. If I looked at the walls of that tunnel, it wasn't brick or cement. It was like air but it was solid, 
So the only way I can kind of think of comparing it to would be like a cloud when you're just about to get a rainbow. And she was just coming closer and closer to us. And I, I think I opened my eyes and it all just disappeared. I suddenly, uh, she suddenly all sort of disappeared in one go. And I didn't think, oh, I've just seen a really weird woman walking towards us from the 70s in a dark tunnel with light outside. All I thought was, is Tom still alive? What was I doing closing my eyes? Why did I close my eyes? And I'm not sure how much time elapsed between that moment and him dying. I don't know. What a beautiful description Amelia offers for, you know, a form of the conductor or a representation of the conductor. Uh, we see this quite a bit in our uh, our studies and have become fascinated with this role and how people perceive it. What is interesting is that um, often the experiencers report that the conductor has little interest in the experiencers. It's as if we are peering in on a process that that they are unconcerned about. It. So, Should we move on or sorry? Yes. Okay. Um, apologize for that. Uh, so let's jump. Let's jump into the second of the features we're going to be exploring here, and it's light. Uh, so this is a very common uh, feature in near-death experiences. Uh, it appears in SDEs as well, although not as common. We we noticed it in about one in every four accounts that we've gathered. Um, Interestingly, what we're going to be focusing on here are different perspectives of this light. Uh, let's start with by examining the case of Natalia. So Natalia, mother, her mother uh, died, and uh, shortly thereafter, she has an experience of light, and we'd like to share that with you. Yeah, we had a very close relationship, and she she did tell me she had a it was oral cancer, so she had a nasty um, first operation in that first year when she was diagnosed and she was in ICU for a while and she was really, really scared. They um, transferred her to a hospice and she was just there for 24 hours and then she passed away. I looked up and <laughs> I've described it and someone asked if it was like an orb, but it wasn't like an orb, I'd more describe it as like a portal, like a hole like an oval hole, probably about like maybe two or three meters away on the cupboard. And it was like, like the rays of, it just, it was like a bright light, like the rays of sun coming out. Just like, they're really, just really bright, so I was a bit, kind of like someone is shining, shining a torch in my eyes. It was, and that's all I saw. You'd see a person, um, but it was the feeling which was more intense than actually seeing something. It was like, and that's why I got so interested in watching the webinars when people especially had like the near death experiences because it was as close to describing the feeling as like, I can never really get into words. Um, just intense like peace and love that like it's multiplied that like you never feel that in this life like even if your wildest dreams came true forever <laughs> and you know no stress anything there's no way of feeling that I could never feel like that so you know, this is fascinating. You, you have Natalia that does not have a near-death experience, but has a very strong experience with a light shortly after the death of her mother, and really has nowhere to put this or make sense of it. As you noted, um, she looked to near-death experience literature. As a matter of fact, a number of, of the uh, individuals that have reported SDEs have looked at NDE literature, and that seems to be the only thing that makes sense to them, that seems to explain phenomena that otherwise people don't have a language to explain or to describe. So now let's go look at the light a little bit uh, from a few different vantage points. And, you know, in the NDE, we see that that is the central, one of the central elements, about two thirds of NDEers report um, the light as a dominant feature. 
Well, in the SDE, it's not as a dominant a feature. And when it is present, there are various different vantage points that experiencers will, will, will share with us. Uh, we're going to see, um, let's see a case now. And this is from Scott Taylor, who's our moderator today. Thank you, Scott. And this is going to be from an experience that he had uh, with his partner at the time, Mary Fran, and her son, Nolan. And Mary Fran uh, died in a car accident. Uh, Scott will talk about this a bit, but to give you some context, her son, Nolan, uh, survived a, a bit longer, I think about a week or so. And Scott is going to be sharing with us his experience at the bedside of Nolan. Well, we had, we had dated for six months. And I would tell you that we were in the uh, euphoric stage of, um, of a relationship. And so I didn't meet Nolan until about four months into our relationship. And um, we, you know, I come over for dinners and, you know, just we go out and dig worms together because we, you know, because we like to fish and, you know, just easy kinds of things. So we had actually spent the weekend together uh, just before uh, the accident. So that was kind of our real first bonding experience. Uh, the accident happened on the 6th of July. And as you know, Mary Fran was killed outright. And then Nolan had this um, head injury that was, rendered him unconscious. Um, he never regained consciousness, at least not in the sense that we know. Uh, and so he was transported to Mayo in Rochester, Minnesota. And it took him six days to make the transition. And then the nurse came in and said, you know, his vital signs are, are slipping quite regularly now. It'll happen soon. So we all got up and you know, filed into the room. And, and as it turned out, I was one of the last people in the room just because of the way you know, we were camped out in that waiting room. And that's how come I wound up being not bedside, but actually sitting on the windowsill, which wound up being important later. So I'm in the room and I have stepped into another dimension. Stepped isn't the right word, but I have entered into another dimension that is simultaneous with the one that I'm in. And so that's how come I could be able to say, I was in this space with Mary Fran and Nolan and, and got to witness their reunion and got to go with them into the light. And into the light meant um, opening to the light that is us all. And and so that's the only language I can I can use is to describe it like that. It's it's a this is why the very first thing when you read about the um, common components of near death experiences, the very first one is ineffable. <laughs> it is really hard to describe what it's like to to be in the physical and at the same time to be someplace else that is this extraordinary place of divine love. So Scott, once again, just beautiful description, not just of the beauty of the light and the power of the light, but also doing a wonderful job of struggling with the ineffability. These experiences are so hard to describe. Well, we so just to be really clear here, the light in the SDE is not always the center of attention. Uh, it doesn't take center stage. It's only in about a quarter of our cases. But both NDEers and SDEers describe the dying as moving towards the light. That is a central motif. And there are different relationships to the light. As we saw Scott you know, eloquently describe, he was both consensus, he was both in his physical body, and he was also right in the light with Mary, Fran, and Nolan. And notice how when 
Angela described her experience, or Natalia, I should say, she was outside of the light, even blinded by a little bit. So the SDE offers a great deal more perspectives on this light. So the third feature that we're going to be discussing today is the life review. Now, this, again, commonly appears in NDEs as well as SDEs. Uh, it does not appear that often in SDEs, however. It only has appeared in about 8% of the cases we've gathered. What we want to focus on is that in SDEs, there seem to be various kinds of life reviews. Uh, the first case we'd like to share now is uh, Susan's. And many years ago, Susan had a boyfriend. And the boyfriend, she found out that her boyfriend had died. And uh, that evening, I believe only a few hours later, uh, she had this experience um, where she has, she undergoes a life review. It started because I had a boyfriend who I deeply loved. Um, and unfortunately, I had to leave him for the summer. My father's business was having issues and they were putting him on loan to different companies. So they sent him up to Boeing to work on the SST. And so we were living in Seattle, Washington, at the time and i received a phone call that my boyfriend had died i was so distraught so distraught um that after crying for hours i finally fell asleep but then i became aware i have to say aware i became aware of a vision and the vision was a tunnel kind of vision and it was like images were all on top of each other and moving and it was everything that he and I had ever done together was going on and I, I was aware of this image and I looked at this image and I knew it wasn't my life because it was just our life together so in my mind I screamed John's dead at which point the image froze and then it shattered like a piece of glass. I opened my eyes, I could still see the image and bit by bit, piece by piece, the glass fell down and as the images clear, I could see the room. So here, Susan's reporting having undergone a life review but reviewing those moments in the life of her boyfriend, those moments that she had been with him. Um, this is a bit of a different case. The next one we're going to, next one we're going to be sharing, and this is Jean. So Jean had a, uh, Jean's father died, and shortly before he died, Jean had a, a shared death experience where she also reported having undergone a life review. Um, in this case, however, as you'll note, she does not uh, recall these memories that she spent with her father. Instead, she seems to have gained access or entry to the private personal moments of his life. I'm such a jokester was because he actually loved everyone so much, he didn't know what to do with himself. So he teased people and tried practical jokes. And it really was, wasn't at all that he was a goof off, you know, which everyone kind of thought he was, although he was a good dad and a good provider. If there was half a minute, he was making somebody laugh. I, my dad passed away first and he, he passed away in 2013 in June. And one day I was out weeding the yard. So I was just by myself. And all of a sudden I saw a whole, a movie of his whole life is, you know, like just sort of by myself doing this weeding. And all of a sudden I'm like, I just start to see this movie and I realize, oh my gosh, it's dad's life. You know, when he was younger and he came back from the war and different times in business and when my brother was born, all of a sudden I realized I was seeing all the, the highlights of his life, the, the times when he was most proud. So when taken as a whole, a it's, it's really interesting that when you look at the life review as it appears in SDEs, number one, it's less common than what we see in near-death experience reports. 
and it can it can consist of a few things. It can include the past events that one shares with the dying. They can consist entirely of the personal life of the dying. Or we've also have a few cases where, as in the case of, of NDEs, people actually relive or re-experience events in their own life. Uh, so we're briefly gonna, we've, we've, we're gonna move from features to some of common after effects that we see evident in both NDEs and SDEs. Uh, these by and large are a reduction in any fears associated with death and dying. Uh, there seems to be an absolute certainty in an afterlife, a benevolent afterlife. There's also a renewed sense um, in meaning in one's life purpose. And then sometimes like the NDE literature demonstrates, people are reporting heightened intuition or the um, some psychical abilities or gifts that seem to be a product of their experience. Uh, in addition to these common after effects, we have noted that there are two unique after effects that we see in SDEs, and these are certainty and coping. Uh, number one is certainty that one will see the loved one that they had the SDE with again. And the other is improved grief reconciliation. These are two, uh, two things that we, we find to be unique to the SDE. And so now we want to talk about some similarities between the SDE and the NDE. Overwhelmingly, we hear these are spiritual experiences. We hear that dying is a journey to a loving, benevolent light. And that this journey may be shared. This is particularly evident in the SDE. And so we want to thank our uh, research participants who really helped shed light on these SDEs. And you know, to be clear, both NDEs and SDEs offer us perhaps the clearest, most uh, informed, authentic glimpse into what happens upon human death and our journey from here to an afterlife. So if you've had an SDE, we ask you to consider contributing to our research by sharing your story with us. And this also includes shared crossings, which are referred to all end of life experiences. You can learn more about uh, shared crossings at OurSharedCrossing.com. And uh, you can also learn more about the programs that we offer. There are a series of educational programs. And so our upcoming book is At Heaven's Door, What Shared Journeys to the Afterlife Teach About Dying Well and Living Better. And we even have a handy QR code for those of you who are technologically advanced. With that, I'll hand it over to Scott for Q&A. Thank you all. Thank you.